after the Parinibbana of the sage of the Sakyamunis, Siddhartha Gautama. His preaching and doctrine, the Dhamma, spread across India and Asia. While the Tathagata was not specific about worship of idols, he left it to the discretion of the person seeking enlightenment as to what is necessary and unnecessary, what is useful and what is useless in his quest. However, after his passing, there was a gradual move to remember him along with his teachings using an iconic devices. Artists initially were reluctant to depict the Buddha anthropomorphically and so developed complex and iconic symbols instead. This continued from the 5th century BCE into the 1st century CE. The first stage of the Aniconic journey was the placing of stone blocks with carved images at temples. This was also followed by the veneration of images of footprints of the Siddhartha Gautama in Sinhalese referred to as Sri Patula. These markings, mainly in granite, contained an impression of footprints and at times was accompanied with multiple markings of auspicious symbols. Sri Pada is one of the most sought after locations in Sri Lanka, where the footprints of the Buddha have been marked as a place for veneration. In the 3rd century CE, the introduction of Buddhism to Lanka through the guidance of Mahindathera, son of Indian Emperor Asoka took place. The implementation of the Mahavihara and the Theravada doctrine gained further impetus. The laity at the time was preoccupied with superstition and believing in the supernatural. In an attempt to change this through Buddhist teachings, the building of temples and places of worship took precedence in the agenda of the ruling kings. The first anthropomorphic representations of the Buddha are presumed to have originated from Gandhara, modern-day Pakistan. The British Museum has a golden casket found in Gandhara in which the Buddha is depicted in human form, along with other Hindu deities. This was the beginning of the portrayal of the Gautama Buddha in a human-like form. After the 5th century CE, gradually the anthropomorphic representation of the Buddha started emerging in Sri Lanka. The exact period is unknown as most statues of the time were probably made of wood or clay and would have perished. This was the beginning of the creation of Buddhist sculptures made of stone, clay and cast bronze, creating a renaissance of religious imagery in Sri Lanka. Iconic art reached its zenith with the combination of attitude realistic features and perfect proportions of sculptures. All these images encapsulated a sense of serenity and strove to achieve perfection. These were created as tributes to capture the essence of the awakened one. Once a set of iconic images of the Gautama Buddha was established, by the sculptures and the artists of the time, there also followed an established set of postures 
he was portrayed in. Buddhism does not have a belief in God in a monotheistic or polytheistic sense as a celestial force to be worshipped. So the presence of these objects was an attempt to express the concept that the Gautama Buddha was a man who had transcended himself by achieving nirvana, moksha or satori. There are three main positions he was always pictured in, seated, standing or lying down. Also referred to as asana or attitude, there are over 100 poses or variations illustrating moments in the journey of the Buddha before and after enlightenment. Each pose will have a specific hand gesture called a mudra associated with it. The hand gestures of the Buddha indicate teaching, meditation, enlightenment and wisdom. For example, the right hand with an open raised palm means a shield or protection, hence reducing one's fear. In Sri Lanka, an exemplary set of examples of these poses are found at the Polonnaru Galvihara. The seated Buddha in a tranquil pose of meditation is the first sculpture one encounters. Adjoining is a smaller statue of the Buddha along with two deities. This enclosure is sealed as treasure hunters have attempted to deface these monuments. Next is the standing Buddha with crossed arms. Finally, the statue of the Buddha at the time of his passing. The style of carving depicting a drooping earlobe and the misaligned feet are clues to this fact. Once the influence of the Mahayana school of teaching took root in the island, there was a move to create bigger and more imposing images of the Buddha and even multiple drawings at the same location. The thought process was probably that one accrued more religious merit when the iconography was large or multiplied. There are temples all over the country which have this style of repetition of Buddha imagery and the largest canvas of multiple images lies conserved at the National Museum. Buddhism in its core teachings refuted the worship of idols. The offering of flowers or paying homage in front of a statue is considered a process of remembering the enlightened one, his life and teachings. Today Buddhism has morphed from its original rigorous Theravada doctrine into other syncretic forms which embrace other philosophies ideas and beliefs. Buddhism is a practice, experiencing the meaning of life through first-hand knowledge and action. Buddhism is also non-theistic. The Gautama Buddha did not specifically teach that there are no gods. The inference is that the concept of believing in gods is not particularly useful for Buddhists in realizing enlightenment. While the veneration of idols is widespread and accepted today, it is understood that these only serve as a reminder of the Gautama Buddha and the principles he founded. In Buddhism, these act as mere symbols for remembering the absolute state, not an embodiment of the divine, a representation of the goal to be achieved, enlightenment, and a means to focus on the religious activities or furthering mindfulness. As in the words of the Buddha, the principle of non-attachment, the ability to leave the raft after crossing the river is the important point to remember. The iconic image of the Buddha and other enlightened beings are objects of reverence, but not as gods. We have to consider that through ritual, we are sometimes able to transcend ourselves into becoming spiritual.